I thought I would start with a John Prine song from his album, The Tree of Forgiveness. It's called Boundless Love. Woke up this morning to a pickup truck. Guess this old horseshoe don't run out of luck. If I came home, would you let me in? Find me some pork chops and forgive my sins. Surround me with your boundless love. Confound me with your boundless love. I was drowning out at sea. Lost as I could be when you found me with your boundless love. Sometimes this heart of mine is like a washing machine, bounces all around till my soul comes clean. When I'm done, hung out to dry. Till you cry Surround me with your boundless love Confound me with your boundless love I was drowning out at sea Lost as I could be When you found me Self at risk, wandering out to the edge of a dangerous cliff. Look below you, then look above. You're surrounded by my boundless love. I surround you with my boundless love. We confound you with my boundless love I was drowning in the sea Lost as I could be When you found me with your boundless love Beautiful. Thank you so much. We are going to have Jean Laporte come and do a little praying and meditation. Uh, Jean Laporte is one of the members of our communities who is actually a really vibrant member. She lives in California and she is um, going to be offering EFT sessions and angel energy, probably as a workshop coming up. And uh, she's helping us to create the um, satellite communities for Speakeasy. So she and I came from the same church in California, North Hollywood, religious science, and we both got our practitioner license there. And uh, so having her here and having some other friends here from uh, my old stomping ground is just really a nice thing. And so I'll pass it to you, Jean. Morning. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be with all of you this morning. So let's just uh, take a moment to close our eyes and put a soft smile on your face because we're gonna give ourselves the gift of communing with the divine. So just breathe and listen.
So staying in this sacred place, this place of our oneness with that divinity, with the Holy Spirit, with God, whatever you call that energy, I know that it is love and how wonderful it is that in its infinite love, in its infinite wisdom, it brought us all here together this morning, that we are each here by divine appointment to be that love, to express that love, extending that love. We know that everything is love and anything that looks unlike it is just a call for love. I know that we are here to answer that call, that we come here this morning to be refreshed and renewed, to be uplifted, to heal and have revealing happen, revelation happen for us. I know that we are blessed by Todd Fink who is going to enlighten us about that masculine power the masculinity which lives within each of us. And I know that we are blessed by Maureen Muldoon and this wonderful community she has created for each of us to be ourselves and to be who we're meant to be. How freeing that is. So I just say, thank you, God, how great thou art. And I release my word into that unconditional love, the law that always says yes, and the light that shines through each and every one of us. I let it be so, and together we say, and so it is. Amen. Namaste. Namaste. So we have such a treat for today. We, not just today, but for the next three weeks, we have Todd Fink in the house, who is an artist, a speaker, he is the host of Kind Mind podcast. And if you don't have a subscription to Kind Mind, like get on it because so much good information. Like you just want to listen to him forever. And so, um, so many insights and um, so many topics he's covered already. So there's just like a wealth of information also over on his website, there's a ton. Um, he's also the co-founder of the Giving Tree Band and his songs and videos and writings and lectures have inspired people from around the world. So we have him for the next three weeks with his music and his messaging. And so I just want to start off by celebrating that. And so if you know somebody who's in need of this message, like be sure to invite them to the series so that you can take this conversation even deeper. So this is Spiritual Speakeasy. Uh, my name is Maureen Muldoon, I'm the spiritual director and it's great to see you all here this morning. We love being in community with you. Thanks Jeannie for that great prayer. Thanks Todd for that great song. Um, if this is your first time, welcome. If this is your second time, welcome back. If it's your third time, we hope that you consider this your spiritual home. Speakeasy is a place to be known and to know a greater uh, idea about yourself. It's an incubator of awesomeness where we help and hope to make dreams come true. Uh, we love celebrating the very best of who we're capable of being. And we are a uh, virtual community with a uh, global message. After Todd speaks, we're going to have a conversation. And the conversation is what I think is one of the most important things that we do. And during the conversation, we ask you to really tap into what is yours to say. Does this need to be said? Does it need to be said now? Does it need to be said now by me? And helping each other find our space to share our authentic voice is so very generous and good. But we ask you not to leave your brains or your beliefs or your backgrounds at the door. No matter what brought you to this moment, like it's all good. We do not have all the answers, but we love entertaining the questions. And we also exist on the generosity of our community members. And so you will have an opportunity to make a donation to, for today's uh, to call daily bread, fresh baked bread, so that we can pay our speakers and keep the conversation going. So we'll put that up uh, along with other websites that might be of interest to you during the conversation. Um, Mari will share during, um, after the conversation about other events that we have and um, and we hope that you uh, you know click in and check out and um, you know this is a place where you can take a class or teach a class so we hope that you come and take some classes they're all free and that you think about sharing your gifts 
whatever that may be. So Speakeasy is a diverse and progressive spiritual community sharing a message of love and engaging in conversations that inspire creative expression and spiritual well-being. We say that truth is our passion, that love is our religion, that care is our currency, and that peace is our goal. Those are our values. The vision is that we um, attempt to speak easily about tough and tender topics so that we can navigate life with a little more grace and ease. And as always, I, I dedicate this time to the Blessed Mother, to the Divine Mother, to Mary Magdalene, to Jesus, to Buddha, to Kuan Yin, to all of the names of God, to all of the saints, and um, even the sinners, <laughs> and all of the enlightened teachers and all of their teachings, especially A Course in Miracles. I want to introduce you again to Todd Fink. Um, aside from that beautiful recognition that he that he is known for being an artist and a speaker and a, a deep thinker and a generous sharer, um, he's just like a, a class great person that you want to know and follow. Like he just really is impeccable integrity, like easy um, humor and laughter, like goes all the way to the deep end every single time like there's no surface thing there and he also walks his talk like he lives what he shares and I find that to be so very refreshing I'm so grateful that he's taking the helm for this uh, sacred masculinity series I cannot think of anyone better for this role and I just deep bow in gratitude and I turn this over to Todd Fink. Thank you so much Maureen. I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I agree with Maureen that the most important part is the conversation. I feel like I'm not really giving a lecture. I'm introducing the conversation that we'll have together for three weeks. I'm willing and open as far as sharing my perspectives here today so that we can create a, a space that's safe for all of us to, to jump in or whoever feels like jumping in. I would like to share some of my experiences throughout these three weeks. And we've called this the seahorse series about mending masculinity. So why, why the seahorse? Well, the seahorse has some beautiful symbolism. I mean, just think of a seahorse for a minute. If you ever see a seahorse, doesn't it just bring um, a special feeling to you? For so many cultures around the world, it is a mystical and magical creature. For sailors and divers, seahorses were symbols of good luck and may even be worn as, as charms to be protected in the sea. It was associated as a symbol of God, uh, the God of water, Poseidon, for ancient Greeks. Also, ancient Greeks called the seahorse hippocampus. If you know a little bit about the brain, we have a hippocampus in our brain that is somewhat similar in shape to the seahorse. And this part of the brain is for learning and memory and growth, which is what we're all gonna to try to do together over the next three weeks. And then most importantly for our purposes, the seahorse is a symbol of power and masculinity. And it's special that it's seen as a masculine symbol because it doesn't behave in a stereotypical manner in all its functions. For example, the seahorse carries the eggs of its young in its pouch, whereas many other animals would be, would be different. The, the mother, the female would carry the eggs or protect the young. But the male seahorse holds the eggs, protects the young, and protects the female. So it kind of points to the construct that is masculinity in our culture and the stereotypes that have developed over centuries. It's called, we're calling this mending masculinity also because problems arise when masculinity as an energy as a phenomenon, as an aspect of the divine or aspect of the natural world, when that becomes synonymous with manhood, then you find limitations in the full expression of uh, the, the spirit in human form. But in my experience growing up, I didn't realize that I had probably a little bit 
unconventional upbringing. My mother and father were had been together for over 40 years, but they both possessed the quality, the stereotypical qualities of both sides of this polarity. I could see my mother become strong and powerful in the face of trouble or threats to me or to our family. Um, of course, my father could do that as well, but there was a period of time that stood out to me in my childhood where he built a house himself by himself, flipped that house, then took a year off work to write poetry and published a, a book of poems, played many instruments, still plays many instruments. And so in between these, all these energies that were nurturing me and my mother's compassion was endless. I found that I had a range of expression as, as a young man that I didn't realize was somewhat unique in, in this world. When I got to college, I had a, a very good friend who became a guitar teacher to me. His skill was unmatched in the entire university, and we became very close. But sadly, I learned that he had no support from his father with music at all. So it was almost like a closet hobby of his. And yet he was significantly more skilled and talented than I would ever be. But because of his teaching and his support of me, I was able to go be a professional musician and tour the world and have all these experiences. And yet I had the freedom to do that because of my understanding of what it meant to be a man and what I could and couldn't do as a man. And he didn't have that luxury. So even in, in my early years of adulthood, I felt something was off there. And, and it hearkened back to experiences I had. It started to put some things together for me with the way I was coached and brought up by other men in my life. And then I started to see that there are big gaps that need healing. And of course, are part of the story of misogyny and, and patriarchy in, in our country and in this world that we'll get into more next week. But I realized that some of the worst ways you could hurt or diminish a man is by labeling him or punishing him with something that has uh, that ties to the female experience. Something from the female anatomy can become the worst thing you can say to anybody. Or in football, if I couldn't, if I didn't have um, the the enthusiasm to go hit this guy or tackle this guy with enough force, you might be called something that represents female body part, and. That was also true emotionally, not just in the choices that you make, but I could also encounter that with the feelings that would arise. Now, we're all human beings, and we all have the same algorithms of fear, love, um, sadness, grief, jealousy. It's all programmed in all, in all DNA, but not all have the freedom of expression. And so I've seen this become um, volcanic in different in different men when I work with people in the hospital because they've suppressed some range. And the, there's a parallel to this for women as well, to express the so-called dominant emotions like anger could be labeled as crazy. If a man becomes angry or expresses anger, he's strong. He's trying to take control of the situation. But if a man cries and express sadness, stereotypically, that could be weak, that could be being like a woman. And in toxic masculinity, God forbid that a man ever be attracted to a man, because why? Women are attracted to men. So all of this started to make more sense to me as I started to navigate the world as a young man and travel to other countries, to other cultures. Now, when I learned about yoga in India, and started to study Eastern philosophy, that's when I started to find the language for expressing the principles of polarity. 
specifically Taoism and this book that I love and continue to study for years and years, the Tao Te Ching, and you're familiar with that symbol. So before we get into next week about all the ways that masculinity needs to be healed in our culture, I'd like to first lay a groundwork about the principles of polarity. What is polarity? In magnets, you have two poles, a North Pole and a South Pole. And therefore, you have some opposites. And in life, when you have opposites, you have opposition. There's a fear in our culture that one side, one pole could win, that the right could totally win and the left could be defeated. But if you think of the underlying unity, it cannot be. No matter how much of the South Pole that you could break away from a magnet, whatever's left becomes the South. You can never remove South. And if you think of a human being, the right and the left hand, they say my right hand is the dominant hand. I'm right-handed. But it's not entirely true that my right hand is stronger than my left. And this is what I think of it with men and women. In life, there's been the, in society, I mean, there's been the attempt to dominate. Domination, social dominance is the insidious disease that we need to cure. But in life, in the body, biologically, the right hand or your dominant hand doesn't try to defeat the other hand. There's a harmony there. And in my case, though I'm right-handed, my left hand is actually stronger than my right because I played the guitar my whole life and having to hold the instrument like this and do all the dexterous movements, my left hand can do things that my right hand could never do. That's how I think of men and women also and the expression of these poles, masculine and feminine. It's not binary in the sense that you're either masculine or feminine, right? So like I said before, masculinity is not synonymous with manhood or male. It's more like light and dark, yin and yang. If you look at the Taijitu, Taijitu symbol, there's a small dot in each of the two sides, which means the non-binary aspect that I'm talking about. And it's not either or. The toxic part of our modern culture is that propaganda always makes us feel that everything is either or instead of a little bit of truth here, a little bit of truth there, the seed of the other. You think of this as expressed as day and night in life, in the world. During the day, there are still shadows. There are clouds. The sun goes behind the clouds. You can go behind a building. In the night, there's the moon reflecting some light. You can still see. Even in the land of the midnight sun, there's some darkness. When it's a month of light, there's still shadows. There's, there's still a, a balance, a, a dance, a play. So you can think of these poles as masculine and feminine. And you, you can think of it as light and dark. And you can apply it to your experiences. And you can break free of the limitations of what a man is only allowed to be or what a woman is only allowed to be or, or which of these energies he or she is allowed to give expression to, then look within the human being and you will find, just like in the Taijitu symbol, that it's all there. Aren't my eyes masculine? They look out. They go out. They grab things, objects, people, and sometimes aggressively. My nose, feminine, the scents go in. My words are always masculine because they protrude and create friction with the air. No matter how sweet my voice is, could be, whatever I say, how nice it could be, it's still a friction. And my ears are passive, like the yin energy. Whether I want to or not, want them to or not, the sounds go in. And so the masculine and feminine as it, as it applies to life is within all of us and it's fluid and it's always in perpetual dynamic flux and motion. We look at nature and we see things as static. We look at the weather and we see the cloudy sky. But when you look closely, 
clouds are moving. You look at the emotion and you see sadness or you see depression. But if you look closer, you see that it's moving. You don't have to push. So the, the subtle part of this symbol is the circle. People don't think of this very much as part of the symbol. The circle represents the absolute. The circle is the container of all the phenomena. The circle is pure awareness. Pure awareness is independent of the poles. In yoga, the, the realization of this, or in Tantra, Tantra has been perverted into just how to have better sex or how to prolong enjoyment in sexual activity because the root word tan means to expand. But in the stories of Shiva and Shakti, those weren't just about sexual activity or expanding pleasure. It was about expanding your consciousness until you are the circle. All things are arising in your being. In yoga, this is manifested as the ascension up the chakras in the spine. And these are called poles. You have a north pole and a south pole. One is not bad, one is not good. But when you bring your energy all the way up to the crown chakra and realize God or divinity or the absolute or Tao, in the atom point at the top, there's no more north. If you were to stand on the north pole, which direction is north? It's a metaphor for realization. Then coming back down, any part of the poles anywhere you find balance or anywhere you want to give expression you realize it's just the divine expressing itself all the way back down in the bottom center has nothing to do with evil the earth is beautiful it's only when there's not divinity this is the the union of shiva and shakti or nature and spirit when there is not the consciousness of divinity what happens People feel separate from the earth. They try to dominate the earth. They try to own the earth, possess the earth. So selfishness happens. Same within the sexual center. When there's not divinity, there's control and jealousy. And in, in the navel center, there's addiction. There's attachment. In the heart, there is um, power and control dynamics. In the throat, there's egotism and right and wrong with philosophical systems. Then when we come back up to the soul center, that's when you find the teacher. You find the, the guide in the cave of the cranium who can take you to the peak, to the top of the Himalayas. So I'll pause here. And I just want to summarize by saying that in the in the coming weeks, we're going to explore how we got deviated from this, how this has become patriarchy and social dominance and, and given expression to misogyny and so on, why we need to heal that, what we can do to bring that more into balance so that these poles are not in competition, but in cooperation and can have full expression in the human being. And then we'll look at what it means to be a man in, in this world, how we can support young men, because in a changing climate, without mentorship, boys and young men can get confused about how they're supposed to, uh, how they're supposed to take care of themselves and mature emotionally. So the last part of this series will explore individual emotional maturity and the spiritual man in the 21st century. So I'll pause there. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to begin this series today, to connect with all of you. I look forward to your reflections and your questions. And um, here we are with the Seahorse series. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, everybody.
could have had a chance could have had a chance Never thought I could make it this far With a dent in my soul and a hole in my heart I never thought I could I never thought I could But when the lights are turning the wheels are rolling on the ground The day I burn this whole place down When the circus comes to town I carved your name out on that tree But you scratch my now right in front of me It didn't mean that much It didn't mean that much But when the lights are turning around The wheels are rolling on the ground The day I burn this whole place down When the circus comes to town your name right off that tree and chase your heart right out of me doesn't mean the much doesn't mean the much cause when the lights are turning around the wheels are rolling on the ground this whole place down when the circus comes to town beautiful thank you god that's good stuff how do we get so lucky <laughs> to wake up together how do we get so lucky <laughs> i feel so lucky we're going to pass this to Mari, who's going to tell us about a few other events, and then we're going to come back to the conversation. I'll pass it to you, Mari. Good morning. We invite everybody to two things. One, you can check out speakeasyspiritualcommunity.com. That is our website. All of our events are there. We have some very exciting events coming up. Also, you will see on the chat a giving link. We invite you to just go within and, and see what is for you to share. Uh, giving and receiving are one in the same. And we invite you to just share your financial gifts with us so we can continue to offer all events that we have for free. Um, this week, actually starting today at one o'clock, uh, we have Art as a Spiritual Practice. It's led by Maureen Claffey. Uh, beautiful practice. It's an hour and you can join us for that. We have tomorrow uh, sacred movement yoga at 730 in the morning central. Uh, but also on Mondays, it's at 430. So if you don't catch it in the morning, you can catch it in the afternoon. And, uh, and in the evening tomorrow, we have key conversations. We also have sacred sanctuary at 818. Um, there are two more days of the practice of Ho'oponopono at that 818 uh, time slot. So uh, join us for that. We are going to be continuing during Sacred Sanctuary, other practices. So keep an eye on that uh, on our website. And throughout the week, we have all sorts of events. We have 12 steps meetings. We have two, of course, in Miracles text study groups, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. And on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, we have introducing the work of Byron Katie, led by Reverend Elizabeth Keats. Um, and throughout the month, uh, the month is just beginning. You can go to our website and at the top bar, you'll see the calendar. You'll see all of the events they are set up for the month. Uh, Culture Club, Mother Moon Gathering. Um, we have the Mary Magdalene uh, Meditations, Death Cafe, uh, Community Visioning. So join us. All of these events are free. 
So we are able to offer this to you uh, thanks to your donations. And we just want to continue to support you spiritually throughout the week, not just today as you get inspired today by Todd, but uh, we want to continue that inspiration throughout the week to, to keep you oh, spiritually you. fed. And I pass it back. Thank you. Gosh, Mari, thank you so much for <laughs> every week giving out the, the menu of possibilities. Other things on the um, horizon, conscious parenting, excited about having a possibility of having a conscious parenting group. We have an LGBT group that is beginning to um, be talked about. We have, hopefully this series will birth a men's group. So um, a few great things. And uh, Mia, who's back, is uh, gonna be doing a uh, monthly uh, cacao rituals. And Mia, I don't know if you were here for it, but I had my first cup today. It was delicious. <laughs> you've, you've given me my new addiction. Thank you. It's one that comes with no hangover. Um, so uh, go ahead and keep supporting us. This is a really great place to, um, to tithe and to support because we do not just good work in the world with supporting other teachers, but we also tithe to really worthy causes. This month we'll be tithing to Foundations for Inner Peace who make sure that the Course of Miracles is publishable and accessible. Um, and now I'm gonna to bring Todd Fink back up and um, you can ask him all the questions and we can start the conversation. I'll start it off with, um, I loved um, the idea of recognizing, because this is a big thing for me, recognizing the inequity around expression like that just breaks my heart to think that we say, what we say to our men about like shut it down zip it up we don't want to see you cry we don't want to know your emotions like that just makes me emotional so um how do we begin to move into a more equality around that i imagine one thing is just to make space for it but are there other ways of um supporting someone from recognizing their equal rights around expression, uh, expressing emotions as opposed to just uh, expressing thoughts. That is, you know, so, so well put and so important. I think, um, you know, one of the clearest signs of this imbalance is the difficulty for some men to say I love you especially to another man or for for boys to be able to tell their friends that they love them I think stereotypically there would be a little hesitance there a little reluctance because of the the misogyny around the softness of love and compassion. So what I, I think is needed is for for us to teach the the power of vulnerability, the the courage, the strength that's involved with being able to be authentic and honest. So I I was able to gradually grow into that freedom of expression with emotion, but it was only because I had the foundation of my family. So even if the whole world rejected me in my honest expression in my songwriting or in my relationships, I knew that my family accepted me. And so not everybody has that. That's what I've realized. But we as a spiritual community have to create that kind of space where people can be vulnerable with their with their truth and can can express themselves and the the gentleness or the softness or the the tenderness of of that side of of the human emotional experience ought to be able to be expressed and there is a subtle power in that and a healing power in that and if we can create the spaces for young men to understand that I think that will go a long way for them finding balance um, in the relation in the relationships that they have thank you anyone yep. else have any thoughts on that um hi this is Jim um 
I really, hi there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a, just an icon. Um, <laughs> not, a, not a face, because I'm moving around a lot. And um, I, I was just thinking about the idea of forgiveness and how much both on both sides, there's these traumas that come up and then everyone's has to feel protected. Uh, they feel like, you know, and, and, and then there's resentments and all those things that build up these walls and make it unsafe to be um, open to vulnerability and safety, you know? It's, so so that's, that's a big, tall order to ask someone who's been traumatized, whether it be male or female, how to, you know, to, but that's the work to me is, is that work of um, compassion and forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a non-gender thing. It's compassion and forgiveness fits, fits everybody. Yeah. One size fits all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And you make a good point, though, about forgiveness being on the soft side it could be uh, categorized as feminine energy. The, the, yeah, you know, the that healing and nurturing that goes with forgiveness. But why why it might be hard for some men in some cultures and some family experiences to not forgive because of the apparent power of a grudge or the masculinity of holding on. And and you also see that in the seahorse, it's a symbol of power because its tail is strong and it will grab onto something and hold on. When it's not doing that, the seahorse is actually not a good swimmer, but it trusts the current of the ocean and flows with the, mm -hmm. uh, goes with yeah. the flow of, of, the, sure. of the sea. Can I say is, um, you, you made me uh, think of in terms of vulnerability uh, or, or and, and really the the courage and the power of vulnerability i i had a friend in college who i i think unwittingly taught me the power of vulnerability because he would cry um uh, openly in front of us in front of his friends just when, when he was moved by something and i think he had the benefit of being six foot nine and he was <laughs> a, a huge man and uh, everyone loved him, but he was not afraid to to weep if 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 his heart moved him. And that, I mean, and I don't know that we ever spoke of it, but that was he was a way shower for me. And I now, um, I cry all the damn time. I'm, I'm a school teacher, and I I cried just this past week. I finished my um, school year with my students, and <laughs> you know, for every class, I end up saying goodbye to them, and. I, I, I cry and I, because I, I feel a, a range of emotions, you know, pride and, and, and guilt for not being better um, teacher for them and, and envy for, you know, the, the, the worlds that are opening to them. And I'm like, yeah, next year I'm going to still be a teacher <laughs> and you're going to be doing amazing things. And, um, but uh, I don't, I really don't feel embarrassment about that. And um, I feel like, as men, that's one thing we can do is, is just like be way showers for others. And, um, you know, emotions are great and vulnerability is power, not weakness. Um, but that's not, that's not what we're taught in, um, you know, mainstream media and, and, and most of society, I think. Thanks for sharing that. Will. that's really beautiful. And, and, exactly right i think that's that's what we can do we can model that healthy expression and and show you know the young younger people people that look up to us or that we're mentoring or teaching in your case we can show that emotions come and they go and when you don't bottle them up when you don't suppress them when you don't judge them you can take care of them you can take care of yourself it's it's sort of like inner weather yeah, there's going to be cloudy days. Yeah, there's going to be waterworks. And then the clouds will part and it will make the other experiences that much more beautiful as well. well yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's powerful. Amen, brother. Inspiring to me too. I feel like I could I could do a better job on that front. So thanks, Will. 
Yeah, it seems like some careers give more permission for that. Like I know that his tall friend was an artist and I know that Will came from being an, an actor. And so, um, and even if the role of a teacher kind of feels like you're around children. So you're closer to being able to uh, appreciate um, emotion. So I wonder if it's also about the roles that we play and what roles we allow to have more emotional expression, but. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, it's really interesting. I learned vulnerability uh, from my therapist who is male and he's the one that showed me um, how to be able to feel that and welcome that. I still hate it. I think it's the worst ever. And I know when I begin to feel vulnerable because it's like that, um, it's a really visceral feeling for me because it comes up and I'm like, oh, and he's like, yes, let's lean into that. And I'm like, no, let's not lean into that. Right? I'm like, I want no part of that. And I feel really inspired by him. And so he's helped my husband and I sit with it and welcome that because neither of our families um, have any idea how to do that. And so I appreciate you, Todd, talking about that experience for men. And if Matt were sitting next to me, I think he would really echo that. And you were saying that um, something along the lines of not that families oftentimes like our um, families of origin have a hard time showing that. And this is interesting, Beth and Maureen and I have been talking about this with my family and I had a really difficult experience this past week. And then I chose forgiveness and reached out to my family of origin and extended that and had this amazing experience where they broke down crying and were like, you didn't know how to just show up and, and just ask if you were okay. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to just say, I'm sorry for what happened. So yeah, this community is the one that has shown me how to be like, it's okay. Maybe we can forgive ourselves and then help them understand how to do that. Um, anyway, powerful stuff. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Morgan. That, is, that was really amazing sharing and gave me a, a few reflections. I'll just say, say quickly because I know other people have their hands raised. But in my recent experiments, I still get scared with vulnerability and I, and I sometimes turn back from that as well. But in the experiments I'm doing, and, and I, that's why I think like therapy is important and creating spaces like this where people can safely experiment in a non-judgmental zone. But I'm learning that I can live with the outcomes of being vulnerable. Like I could tell somebody I love them or I feel hurt or something. I can't live very well anymore with the inauthentic aspect of myself or I can't live with um, the closed version of myself that I'm not at peace with. When, when I give that expression respectfully, assertively, then I feel like I can, I, I'm already good. I'm practicing being good and unattached to the outcome. We can never control the shape things take. We can only control the motive behind the choice, behind the expression. No matter what choice one makes, um, the shape the universe will take can can be any which way. So I think learning that can give people the courage to be vulnerable as well. Thank you. Yeah, and just last thing is what I said to my sister is, I just wanted you to validate what I was feeling. Right, wrong, or crazy, what was coming out of my mouth. What I needed you to say was, it's okay. Like, I understand what you're feeling, just validate it. And instead what she was so quick to do was just reassure, we're gonna solve it. It's gonna like, let's move on. And I was like, but it gets me stuck in my emotions when somebody doesn't validate them. So, thanks. I think that's so important because you taught me that Megan and it's so uncomfortable as problem solvers of the world to not pr solve the problem, to just be be in the current experience of the rainstorm like it's just raining right now 
don't try and rush to the sunlight or to say we're going to mop this up so we don't have to deal with the 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 rain it's like it's so uncomfortable and i i know that you appreciate that because you and i are just like just let me fix you and save you like i don't want you to experience any emotions that are not positive mm -hmm. i know <laughs> he's laughing because it's the truth and it's a hard it's a hard habit to break to just make space so thanks for sharing that key tool of validation you know i understand what you're feeling i see that you're feeling this it's just a script i need to tattoo on my eyeballs <laughs> so hi todd thank you so much and i really really enjoyed that so good to see you again yeah good to see you too. i loved last week with you oh thank you so much um my question, I suppose, is around, um, I'm just looking at two of my daughters who at the moment are in very strong, I suppose, expressions of more what you'd call a feminist. Um, one of them got up this morning and she was wearing a t-shirt and it said, a bitch is a woman with boundaries. And, you know, I noticed a reaction in me to the t-shirt and, you know, we had an interesting discussion about it. But I suppose I'm wondering, could you speak to how do we rebuild I suppose the trust between the masculine and the feminine both within ourselves but outside ourselves is what I'm really thinking where men feel safe with women and women feel safe with men to move into that place of absolute vulnerability where I think the healing will occur but even just steps towards just rebuilding the trust and well I really appreciate that question and that that point um that that is so powerful. I meet with a lot of people in the hospital and a lot of women confide in me that they are confused about what the feminist movement is or where they fit in. And there's a new kind of stereotype for young women. And, and I think it's personified by the t-shirt that you're talking about. What I, what I think would be helpful, and again, this is just my perspective, I think, I'm very open to what else could possibly be helpful to to bring healing and harmony is like I was saying in the beginning, I, I don't think it's helpful for bringing about more harmony in society to make masculinity synonymous with manhood and femininity synonymous with women. I do think there are women's issues in our country specifically, just like unequal pay, things like that. And that may or may not have something to do with how feminine a woman is. It may have nothing to do with that, or may have little to do with that. But it does have a lot to do with sex. Uh, so so I think there's some, some issues that get conflated and then actually hold people back. And I wouldn't doubt that all of that are tools of the patriarchy. Because again, when you when you divide the group that's oppressed, it's very hard for them to, like women as a whole, to achieve the changes, not really achieve, remove the barriers. Freedom is never something that's acquired. It's always something, freedom is actually freed by removing the constraints. But so long as you can conflate some of these issues, I think some of those constraints being removed will be delayed. Um, and... Yeah, and so there's there's a there's a new kind of problem with being boxed into certain stereotypes where feminine feminine and masculine get mixed up and young women feel like they have to be masculine because they were denied the expression of masculine energy. But that creates a certain kind of almost mental mental health crisis for some women. A lot of young women that I see in the hospital will say I have anxiety disorder because society pressures me so much to build my career, to be independent, to be my own person, to not need a man, for instance, and at the same time, I'm ready to be a mom. I want to be a mom. But if I do that, I feel as though I'll fail the feminist movement in my 20s. And how, how do you live up to all that? You know, so my my... My response is, again, to all this is holding space and letting people really unpack these concepts. 
bringing in indigenous wisdom, bringing in wisdom from the East and the West, so that we can understand the principles of polarity and begin to unpack these issues and understand what what we really all care about. I think so many people actually care about the same things, but because some of this gets conflated, we get confused and we end up fighting each other. So thank you for bringing that to light, Mia. Yeah, thank you. And I think actually listening now and tying pieces together with, I think it was Mari earlier was saying, and it all, it, it kind of comes back as well, I'm seeing in my daughters to actually needing that space to be heard before the healing occurs, if that makes sense. So yeah, there's, um, thank you. Thank you so much. I think rituals are really important, but for this, but not necessarily traditional rituals, because traditional rituals conjure up different wounds for different people. And some of the ways that these concepts have been expressed in different wisdom traditions have been oppressive also. So I do think it's time for new spirituality. Not not that like feminine and masculine will, will be reinvented, but I think families, individuals, couples can create their own rituals together and men's groups ought to create safe spaces where something becomes ritual. We meet monthly and we open our hearts to each other. We meet on the full moon and in the light of the full, full moon, we take a vulnerable step in our life. And the ritual is about marking transitions. This is what's lacking in or missing in modern culture in terms of wisdom. And this is also a problem with aging. Our culture is becoming more and more resistant to aging and maturing. Nobody wants to grow old, but we all have to die. And younger people are not able to see what elderhood looks like. They're not getting good mentorship. So they are struggling with the transitions through life because there's no rituals and there's no guidance. A lot of mental illness manifests after high school because it's a transition from youth to adulthood. But since everybody wants to be a youth forever and wants to be beautiful and young forever, kids don't know how to successfully navigate that transition. In indigenous cultures, like you talked about, I, I, I'm no expert at all, and I don't, I don't want to claim that I have any special knowledge of indigenous rituals. But the little bit that I'm aware of from talking to friends in, in those communities is that there were people who were mentors there were wise people that would lead a young man or woman into, into the transition. And part of that transition is being vulnerable. So like the vision quest was, would happen in some, in some traditions with a young man or woman, and they would have, have to go to a place they've never been to before so that they could be more thrown into uncertainty. But the elder would be waiting on the other side. They're there to initiate it. They're there on the other side. That's what's special about the rituals that you're talking about or the men's groups or women's groups that, that people have support through a transition. That transition might be in the stages of life. It might be healing from divorce. It might be a stage of grief. It might be from one job to another, or it might be in the blossoming of our emotional maturity. I'm going to take this step and tell another man how much I love and appreciate him or tell my friends that I love them. And I never felt free to do that before. So it's a trans transition. And if I have rituals and support, then um, it, will, it will wire a new pathway in the brain. The ritual actually takes place in special parts of the brain that helps synthesize different synapses in a way that we may have never used before so that in the future we have more courage to be vulnerable again thank you yeah i just wanted to add one thing before beth comes in um you know what you're talking about todd in regards to mentorship and um going to places that you don't know that you can go to um, for me, the modern version of that is already been mentioned um, by Mario is the 12 step, 
you know, that you get this sponsor and this person has your back and it's so scary to build trust with somebody, but usually they have what you want. And, you know, Speakeasy was created around the, the concepts of 12 step, but I wanted to like create a community that you didn't have to be a broken winged person to get the benefits of a 12 step type program. And because that's also stigmatized as well. So it's kind of like we've taken all of our rituals and just kind of like tossed them out the window and, and not realizing what we've lost. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, but I do know that there are there are there is availability in the 12 step for having some of those things um yeah i just i'll just want to add real quickly on that you're so right that's why 12 step has worked for millions of people when they truly open their heart to it big part of it is the safe space the support and there's rituals all along the way and there's mentorship this actually works for people without addictions Right. I've encouraged people without addictions or just with depression or self-harm or uh, anxiety. Turn to the, the wisdom of the 12 steps, find your own rituals, and it works. It, it, it's, a, it's a philosophy of life. And you're right. We need to bring the, that wisdom that is there for when people hit rock bottom and make it more accessible to all people so that they don't have to hit a rock bottom before they could be exposed to support and wisdom and mentorship. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say how much I'm appreciating and enjoying this conversation, first of all. And uh, Todd, uh, you've so beautifully shared, you know, the concepts of polarity. And when you talked about if you break off, you know, one pole, the part that's left is going to be that pull and how like you think you're getting rid of something, but you can't, that's just not how it works. And so I, what came to my mind um, that I'd love for you to share, if you have any wisdom on this is in those moments when um, there's kind of a, an amputation or sort of like, I don't need this anymore uh, kind of energy, whether it's like, I don't need men anymore or you know, I don't need women anymore or any sort of way of attempting to amputate an aspect of who we are. Uh, in that moment, what kind of wisdom or tool do you have to offer for right there in that place? Thank you, Beth. Um, it's a great question. Personally, I think this is where the wisdom of meditation comes in. And that is the container of the, of the yin yang symbol. When you practice meditation, when you get triggered, if, if we can learn to step back, that's the time when it is night in our relationship, when you're like, I can't do this anymore. With the principles of polarity, you'll see that night is not evil. Good and evil is more human construct, social construct. But night simply means nature is telling you to retreat and tend to the light in your heart. If we stripped away all the layers in this spiritual community, we're pretty sure that what remains is light. Light of the soul, light of divinity. So... All, all of it exists within us. That's what meditation will reveal to a person also. Whatever you see is the hardship externally is the projection of what exists internally. Nobody is free from a thought of jealousy their whole life, the, the thought of aggression, the, the thought of ill coming to someone at some point in their life. These are just natural phenomena that arise. And yet when it's given full expression in our external environment we feel like that that is the evil right and it makes our heart want to completely close but what i would encourage instead is to see that as an extreme expression of the nighttime and when people try to force their way through and work through the night they don't have the en the right energy but it's not evil because if you retreat in the right way if you step back with patience 
and tending to your own inner resources and guarding your own inner light, the season of night passes or the season of winter passes. It's more about knowing how we how we can be in terms of the spectrum of masculinity and femininity depending on the circumstances of our life, even in a relationship. A relationship is not a thing. It's a series of it's a sequence of experiences that you have with another person. They're not all going to be clear experiences. It's not going to be sunny every day. And that's nature. And not seeing it as good and evil will help a person know how to respond wisely. But meditation is the tool. And um, the, the word for evening and sunset, all these transitions in the day and noon and midnight in Sanskrit, in the ancient language of yoga and meditation, was sandhya, which is a compound word, samyaktyana, which meant any time a transition is coming, practice dhyana, which is meditation. Whenever you hit these roadblocks, treat it as the transition of the day. Mm -hmm. Time for me to step back and tune into my inner light and then come back when the, when the circumstances are different. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Todd. Sherry, you're up. And just one more thing real quick. So it becomes toxic when we think my masculinity will take control of the situation. This person not listening to me, well, I'll make them listen by shouting or, or God forbid, by becoming aggressive or becoming violent. That's all the, the unnaturalness of, uh, the, of the situation. So in Chinese wisdom, there's something called Wu Wei, which means natural, naturalness or natural unnaturalness or unnatural naturalness where like the seahorse, you're not resisting the current, you're working with the current. When you go against nature, the real ill is, is that there is delusion. The person sees themselves as separate from, from nature. And as a separate ego, they could get control of the situation. That is the real, the real ill, or if you could say a sin, is just feeling as though you're an independent entity in the universe separate from divinity. Thank you. Sherry. Morning, Todd. Thank you for all that you said. You have unpacked so much that I'll be thinking about for days. You've joined the list of people that I'd love to have dinner with so that I could ask you question after question after question. But one question that I have in my mind right now is so many of us have had to be both, both by being parents without partners. So therefore you are soft when you need to be soft, but you're not soft when you need, you need tough when you need to be tough. But then there comes a time when you want to date or step out from that situation. And it's like, who shows up? The soft person or the hard person? Um, is it supposed to be a fluid thing that's moving from masculine to feminine? Can it be one level or are you, you understanding what I'm asking? I'm not understanding what I'm asking. I think but I, I think sure. what I'm asking is really, are you saying is it supposed to be something that just goes like this throughout our lives for balance? Or can you be half and half for balance? That, that's my question. Thank you, Sherry. It's a beautiful question, and it ties into what we will... It's a great segue for next week as well, because it's going to tie into the limitations that are created by culture. So it, it part of the pain of being a single parent is thinking that I ought to be able to fit into one of these two sides or somewhere on the spectrum and get to exist as that. Exist as that. But as I said, like in my own upbringing... Both my father and mother were masculine and feminine at different times. And in that moment, like if I was in crisis with my mother somewhere, in that moment, she can't rely on my father or I can't rely on my father and vice versa. So the reality is in life, we have all of this within us. Society, though, tells us we have to be defined 
society is always what is reflecting an image onto us. The the mirror of society. Without society, you go into the woods and you go walking in nature, you have you have no identity that you have to prove to the trees, to the nature. It's society that does this to us, that tries to define us. But again, with support, we can understand that we're safe to be whatever we need to be in the moment. And, and that applies also to the relationship. So even if we were a single parent, when we come to a relationship, it's still going to be dictated by the nature. So, for example, if my partner has something to express, can I be the complement in that moment? Can I be the receiver? Well, receiving is feminine. The ears are feminine. Can I listen? But if I force my masculinity, what happens? Masculinity becomes toxic in that moment when the man thinks, I will fix you. I will fix your situation. And it's, it's quite common, quite normal. And that, that's also a, a cultural conditioning. But validation isn't trying to fix. It's about holding space. And the man may do that. The woman may do that if, if the man has something to express. So there's always a dance. And if we understand that, Sherry, the, the beauty of it is we can accept ourselves in each moment. We can have love for ourselves, knowing that the, each moment will show us how to be. And we can respond wisely. We can we can be the partner with life in that way, the co-authors with life. It's a dance, and all of it exists within us. The light is within us always. So whatever darkness is there is always with the light of, of our own being, of our own consciousness. So thank you. This will be our final question before our final song and our pray out. But so grateful for all of the contributions to this conversation and we will you know be moving it forward for the next two weeks so and maybe beyond so um be sure to come back and invite your friends but our final question is with cinnamon hi um so i just wanted to um comment on some of the things that you know todd brought up this is such a good conversation and one is about the need for rituals and um Oh gosh, you just mentioned it. Oh, about not needing to prove your identity to the trees. And I think it's so important when we think of the context of how young people are starting to use, develop and use different labels for themselves. So it's not just this cisgender binary of male or female, it's trans, it's non-binary, it's two-spirit, it's gender fluid. So as we have this conversation about masculinity, um, I also want to bring into context of Rat of beyond just how we are identified or how we're labeled at birth, as in what does it mean to have rituals of um, stepping into adulthood or adolescence or even older age if you don't identify as a man or a woman? There's still masculine and feminine energy. So how do we have those conversations and teach our young people and ourselves, because we have a lot of learning to do, how do we bring those conversations into the fuller gender spectrum? Um, and I know it seems like the young folks are slicing gender and sexuality into a million different slices, but I think they are challenging us to come out of this framework that even I was raised with, where there's just this or that. And it really speaks to Todd's point of masculinity being less about these are the genitals you have, and this is how you were raised, and more about just moving through the world in a sense that's perceived as masculine, um, masculine energy, as it were. So I think it's a very interesting discussion, particularly if we talk about men's and women's groups. What does that mean when someone's binary? What does that mean when someone is trans? And that will make people uncomfortable because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of wounds around how these genders have interacted with each other, and so I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, we, as you know, folks who didn't really maybe didn't grow up with those labels, have to do some unlearning and get uncomfortable before we can, I think, really embrace masculinity and femininity residing within one person. So. That's all I just wanted to uh, mention today. 
Thank you. There's a lot of wisdom in what you said. Um, and, and it speaks to a couple things that I'm a little bit familiar with, with my training with a, with a master in India. The master there um, doesn't do the ritual with, with me or with anybody at a set moment in your life. And similarly, in some indigenous cultures, it's not like you do the vision quest on your 16th birthday, no matter what. The mentor, working with the young person and learning the contents of their heart, decides together when is it time for the transition. So that's something that's missing in our society. And it's missing in our education. We do our education en masse. So everybody goes from first grade to second grade at the same time, whether you're a visual learner or whether you're an auditory learner or a kinesthetic learner. It's challenging. Will would probably know this and anyone who teaches here. It's, it's challenging to meet your standards and also give what you know each child needs in the way that they learn. So it can't always happen in every, in every one of these uh, systems. But in our families, in our spiritual circles, we can help people make those transitions based on understanding, acceptance, and love, getting to know the true vulnerable contents of a person's heart. We can build our rituals and our support, and we can seek out wisdom and mentorship from people who have been through that transition. So, yeah, I think it's a great point. It's something that I think we're still building as a society. And that masculinity and femininity is, isn't binary in the sense that you're either here or here. It's, it, it could be like a dial where there, you're right. There are infinite turns of expression, if infinite modes of expression um, with, with that whole spectrum of energy. And it's all within us. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I have tons more to share, but I'm going to butt my lip, let it marinate until next week. It's a good but, problem that we have right now. That there's so much more. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, just yeah. Tip of the iceberg right now. I'm just grateful for the conversation. And I'm sure more will be revealed. Please share this with your friends and family as we move forward. This video will be up on YouTube as fast as my little fingers can edit and get it up there. And Todd is going to close with a song. It's been a pleasure, everyone, launching the series today and connecting with you all. I appreciate your reflections and your questions. Such beautiful insight and wisdom to carry the conversation forward. And I hope you can do so in your relationships and in your families as well. And the one step and he's sliding And the two steps and she's gliding Three, one and a two Then they float in the air Side to side as she shows him Back and forth cause she knows him Round, round again, all who see them can't help but stare. Cause everyone knows their love. Everyone knows their love. Yes, and everyone knows their love by the way they dance. Hand in hand as he leads her Cheek to cheek cause he needs her Face to face cause they know They'll never dance alone And everyone knows they're in love Everyone knows they're in love Yes, and everyone knows they're in love by the way they dance. By the way she moves in surrender, ever so sweetly.
Suddenly she wins him completely By the way he holds her so gracefully The hand that he lends her is able and tender Never a step to chance And everyone knows they're in love A plus, A plus. <laughs> Thanks for staying for the whole conversation, everybody. And it's keep a dance. Up. Yeah, it's a dance, man. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the continuation of this. Add your thoughts, questions, comments up on the Facebook page, and Todd can reach out. And you can reach out to Todd through Kind Mind Podcast through MichaelToddFink.com. Michael's my first name and my dad's name, so I just usually go by Todd. Michael but the Todd. website's MichaelToddFink.com. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys. God bless. Bye.